This edition of Mac Voices is supported by you, our viewers and listeners, through our new Patreon campaign. If you get value from Mac Voices, please consider helping support the show by visiting patreon.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we have the privilege today of having two guests on that are the hosts of one of my favorite podcasts that is not exactly a technology podcast, but it kind of is or sometimes crosses over into tech. The podcast is The Next Track, and the hosts are uh, Kirk McElhern and Doug Adams. Gentlemen, welcome to, uh, to Mac Voices. Thank you for being here. Thanks, good to Chuck. see you again, Chuck. It's great to see you both. I, I've, I know I've had both of you on the show for different things, and a lot of time we're talking tech. But this time, I thought you two would be the perfect ones to have a little bit of a music discussion. Um, and especially, my, my focus today is the recent announcement that Amazon is no longer going to let you upload your music to their servers. Um, and it seems, if I've, if I've read it correctly, it's that way for all of their plans, not just a free plan, not just a paid plan, but everything. If you have it, it is going to stay there for a year. So they're giving you a year's notice, which I give them credit for. But, and I can talk about this as we go along, but it, I, I was on the verge of paying for, app, uh, excuse me, for the Amazon Prime Music. Um, and when this announcement came out, it sort of killed the decision for me. And so I'm kind of curious what you two think about this. Is this is this a surprise? Is this a deal breaker for either one of you? I don't use it, but I have a very good friend who has been spending the past couple of years slowly uploading his entire CD collection into Amazon Music. He's not the biggest tech guy. He just liked he liked Amazon because he had Amazon Prime and was part of the part of that. And he wanted to be able to listen to music on his phone, which is an Android phone. And so he got this, was adding his music slowly but surely. And now he's left out in the lurch. He had this great system, as far as he was concerned, where he could listen to the stuff he liked at home and on the car and all that stuff. And now he's, this is the fear, I think, that we've always had about subscription services and things like that, where what happens if they suddenly go out of business or stop providing the service or whatever number of it or decide to cancel uh, this service. Um, it's a scary <laughs> thing. They've given you, it's nice that they've given you a year to, to, to take down your music if you've uploaded it. Um, but it's kind of sad that it's going away. I, I wonder if it's a harbinger. I wonder if they know something about music downloads that we don't, them being Amazon and have maybe having an understanding about how file sales are going, how many people are actually using this service, and that sort of thing. And I wonder if they're just preparing for the future, which would seem inevitable anyway. Kirk, how about you? Um, does well, this make a difference I've never to you? used the Amazon system. I, I've begrudgingly um, adopted Apple Music recently, and we talked about it um, a few episodes ago on the next track. Both of us have slowly adopted Apple Music and have, have sort of gotten away from necessarily focusing on our own library. For, for all of the reasons of discoverability, availability, and in particular, the recent um, decision by ECM to put all their music on streaming um, w was really good. You know, there was only really two streaming services where you could do this. I don't think you can do this with Google Play Music. Can you upload your own files? Wow, I forgot about Google Play Music. I, yeah, I, so... <laughs> My, my partner's brother is here for a few days for Christmas, and he uses Google Play Music. Of course, he used to use the Microsoft Groove and whatever the Xbox Music before that. So he has a history of picking failing technology platforms. Like he was a very <laughs> big Windows Phone user and all that. Um, but the the thing about uploading music, and I, and I think we discussed this um, a couple months ago when we were talking about Apple Music. But for me, the original promise of Apple Music was the ability to take my library, merge it with the 40 million track library in Apple Music, and have the combination of my own music and, and Apple's music at the same time, which was disastrous because when Apple Music matched my tracks, it would change tags, it changed album artwork, and everything got messed up to the point where both Doug and I, when we use Apple Music, we have Apple Music libraries that are separate from our own music. Um, let's assume that they were the only two players that allowed uploads, Amazon and Apple. If that just leaves Apple, um, I think what it says mostly is that there aren't that many people who care about uploading their music, that 
people want the simplicity and don't want the hassle that we've seen with Apple Music of merging a library if they have large libraries and they're content to just stream. And, th and this is why I wanted to have you two on because I'm not sure that the three of us aren't outliers a little bit. Um, if, if anyone listens to the next track or know either one of you, they know that that you have a very eclectic taste. They also know that you are often paying a lot more attention to, um, shall we say, unauthorized music um, recordings, um, like I do, uh, just because you, live you, recordings, you, yeah, yeah, bootlegs, live recordings, FM broadcast <laughs> recordings, that kind of thing, um, and and they are they are for me an important part of my music library, and so not to have them available, I mean, it just it feels like. I've I've had to adopt your your uh, your solution as well to have two two libraries. There's often it's like a Venn diagram. There's there's often a very big overlap, but you know it it just and and I've I, I said I would explain why this has become such a big thing for me. I was on the verge of paying for Prime Music because I got a Sonos One um, during the during the holidays when the discounts were on, and I found it very very nice to be able to use my Sonos all over my house and say, "Hey, you know who? Play, you know this in the bedroom. Play this in the den. Play this in the office." It it was great. It's like okay until Apple gets this figured out and the word is that it's coming, I'll just I'll pay for this. And I'll upload, you know, some of the things that I consider really important, so that they're they're available for me. And then when I heard this, it's like I'm not going to waste my bandwidth. I'm not going to waste the time or the effort. I would almost rather just stick with what I've been doing now. So, does that really make us outliers, uh, or are we? Is this just one of those cases where it's not built for us? I think they're dragging us, kicking and stream, screen, kicking and streaming. Very good. Um, Thank you. Um, one way or another, there's going to be streaming in our futures. And while some of us have, I mean, I like holding on to CDs and, and file downloads and, and all my all my files that I've recorded. But at some point, we're going to lose control of that. And we're not going to be able to use our music, as you we're finding out now, with the services um, that, that these companies want us to pay for. So, I mean, it, it's almost like, it's almost like, having LPs, not everybody has a turntable anymore, but if you've got old LPs, maybe you still got that old turntable and you're still playing. Well, maybe in a few years it'll be like, well, I still have some files I recorded a few years ago, or I still have these cassettes I recorded. I mean, it's all the same. It's a it's a format that seems to be, it, it's just lying, lying back while streaming takes over. Because that's, let's face it, that's how young people are listening to music. They're streaming it. They don't want to buy. The idea of buying music is rather strange and insulting almost it seems to me to some people they just prefer exchanging the playlist that they get on spotify it's interesting that you bring this up because the, the we're recording on thursday and tomorrow the next episode of the next track is entitled um sorry i need to check the exact title how much music is too much and, and we mused about the fact that some people have very large libraries and we were discussing um, the fact that neither of us really buy CDs anymore, except for some occasional things. So, you know, I'm a Grateful Dead fan, and I buy their regular um, live recordings that they release every three months in their box sets. And these are things that aren't available on streaming. So it's not going to break my heart to not have the latest Grateful Dead recording streamable. But when you think about the fact that you can't merge everything without a hassle, it really makes the whole process uncomfortable. Um, you know, Doug said young people aren't buying music anymore. That's not true. My son um, is really into what's called EDM, electronic dance music, um, also ambient music and, and things like that. And he buys music from the artists that he really likes, even though some of it's available for streaming. He even had a subscription with a, a small record label for a while where I think for $50 a year, he got access to all their releases. They released maybe a, a dozen albums a year. So he's not averse to buying if it's something he really likes and if he's supporting an artist. Um, but when it comes down to it, yes, we're outliers. As, as I mentioned in, in the, the, the podcast episode, someone at Apple told me a couple of years ago that the average music library is about 3,000 tracks. And they know this because of the, the data that they get, the analytic data from iTunes and, and iPhones and all that. Um, 
I've got about 65,000 in my main library. Doug, what do you have? About 30, 50, something Altogether, like that. And Altogether, each of us has created a second. And each of us create a second library. So we've shunted off music we don't really need in the main library. Um, I don't know how many tracks you have, Chuck, but we're we're definitely more music. We're more interested in the globality of music rather than just what's popular today. And that definitely makes a difference in the way we're going to consume music. Okay, so Doug, you brought up something that I wanted to touch on, um, and and I, I was kind of surprised that there wasn't more of a, a backlash at some point, when Netflix was becoming really popular, and and all these things were coming online, and then then things started to leave Netflix. We started to see these articles. I, I've, I'm afraid I will give credit where credit is not due to Wired or Engadget or someone, but I'd see these regular articles, you know, this is what's leaving Netflix this month, this is what's coming to Netflix this month. And I fe felt like that was a little bit of a bait and switch because I, let's say I paid for Netflix and I anticipated that all of Series A is going to be there and it's going to be available for me to consume on demand whenever. And then all of a sudden, it leaves for licensing reasons. And movies come and go. And there's such a big controversy right now for some folks over the Star Wars movies, you know, moving over to Disney. And and that's kind of what I'm concerned with with all of the streaming services that, okay, this if, if I could have the streaming service and be assured that everything that is there is going to stay there, I might feel better about it. But right now, I'm not feeling those assurances. Am, am I just am I seeing a problem that doesn't exist? I think the uh, the way movies are handled and the way music is handled legally and and how royalties are paid are, are different. So that's why you see more of a windowing with the movies. I think you know they're they're talking about distribution channels that uh, I don't have any idea about. I know a little more about music though, and I think knowing how record companies are, as long as they can squeeze a penny out of somebody, they're going to make stuff available. So. <laughs> That's why LPs never went completely away. That's why, uh, you know, CDs haven't gone away yet because they're still making a sizable chunk of change from from the, this media. Um, movies and TV shows, you're right, they are different, and I wish I knew exactly how they are different, but it just seems to me that the more music that's available, it's almost like this 70s mentality, the more we make available, the more money we'll make. And I, and I think that that philosophy kind of still holds true today with the streaming services. So I'm not really worried about having music pulled. I did worry about um, if I put my collection up there or if I, if the only way I can access my collection is by paying a fee every month and suddenly this business disappears, then I think there's a real, you know, there's a real fear there that you're going to lose your music. But as long as I still have a pile of files on my iMac, I'm going to be okay. So that's why I've been okay with Apple Music because if they ever do decide to get rid of it, or if for some reason I can't access, it won't make any difference to me because my collection does not depend on Apple Music. I use Apple Music for casual listening. Um, but for critical things and the things that I love, I still buy the CD or most likely, more than likely, uh, buy the file download. As Doug said, movie licensing and TV licensing is, is pretty Byzantine. And I think a lot of what goes on, you know, if you think about Disney pre-streaming, you remember how they would release a movie on video cassette for about a year and then it would disappear for five or six years to build up desire for the next time they re-release it? Um, and, and there's part of this is, is a strategy that they use. Um, if it's always available on Netflix, then no one's ever going to buy the DVDs or the Blu-rays. So they do want to, you know, for big titles, they do want to have a, a, a shift in availability. Now, while you were talking about this, I fired up my uh, my Apple Music library, which I keep on my laptop. Um, I have about 30,000 tracks in the library and have a smart playlist showing the tracks that are no longer available. So this means that the record label has pulled them from Apple Music. But since they're in my library, they show up as that status no longer available and they're dimmed. And there are 336 items. Now, that's only 1% of my library, but it's still... You know, Charles Ives' Four Symphonies, um, a very good recording. A bunch of Bebop Deluxe records, which is kind of surprising. Um, a Brad Meldau recording, which is a, a jazz pianist I really like. Um, a handful of a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Um, Miles Davis, one of the bootleg series. So there's a wide variety of music that is no longer available. And this is always a risk with anything that is a, a sort of 
all you can eat licensing system. Um, someone once on a podcast said to me, sort of flippantly, oh yes, with Netflix, I can watch any movie ever made. I said, dude, you can watch 1% of movies ever made. Find me, you know, Citizen Kane on Netflix. Find me Andre Tarkovsky's movies on Netflix. You won't find a lot of stuff. You'll find, actually, you find a lot of bad movies on Netflix. You know, we all do the Netflix shuffle, right? You want to watch a movie, you spend 45 minutes trying to find something. And by the time you've not found something and given up, it's time to go to bed already. Um, so music is totally different as far as that's concerned. You know, the vast majority of what's there is going to stay there. But I think the uploading matching thing is... It's not ideal, but for most people it doesn't matter. If you've got a, a, a library of 3,000 tracks, and this includes purchase tracks from the iTunes store, and of course they match automatically. Your purchases are already in the cloud, so you don't even have to do anything. And it's not even a question of matching and retagging or anything. So it really only affects a small percentage of people. On the other hand, um, in the, the podcast episode, I read some comments from someone I know who has a very large iTunes library, 480,000 tracks in his iTunes library. Um, you know, the bell curve, the, this guy's got none, the, the top is around 3,000, then you get to the end, 100,000, 200,000, 400,000. It exists. These people can't even use Apple Music because it's limited to 100,000 tracks for matching. Um, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, we just have to accept it. We have no control. Even if we built up music libraries over over years and, and almost two decades now since the iTunes store, um, we'll just have to make do. You either have your own music library, you have your Apple Music library, and, and it's getting harder to combine them. And it's the same with Amazon. Um, if you can't combine it, well, you could spend a lot of time trying to add to your Amazon online library all the stuff you've uploaded. Um, if you've uploaded a lot, that's going to take a long time and you won't find everything. But, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say, where I grew up. We are in a we I think we are outliers. And I think most people who want to listen to music, I always think of the average radio listener. Um, they just they find their favorite radio station because that's the station that plays the songs that they know and they know what they like and they like what they know. And streaming services allow them to have just that much more customization over what they want to listen to. So they don't have to have files and they don't have to worry about uploading them or anything. They're all right there in the web app and they're all right there on the, uh, on, the on their iOS app. So the idea of actually possessing the music isn't necessary because the music is disposable anyway. If, if, you know, if, if they don't, they don't, they're not compelled to listen to it. They just want to listen to it. And if they didn't have it, that would be okay. But it's just an easy way to get the music that they like, sharing playlists with friends and things like that. It's, it's not about the 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 acquisition of of files and 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 having the music. It's just about being able to hear it, being able to access it. If it disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't make that much difference. They'd and they'd pick the a different on. playlist if it disappeared tomorrow. Because, right. you know, the, the the term we often use is music is wallpaper, and that's how most people listen to music. And if a playlist goes away, if Taylor Swift pulls her records, they'll just move on to something else. This is this is a fickle audience. Um, you know, the 80-20 the thing that everyone cites as a rule is just an approximation, but I would guess 20% of people really care about music, and 80% just put it on to fill in the space and to not have silence. I, I don't disagree with any of that, um, and and I don't know. The next track, your podcast, is about. I, I love the tagline: "The way people listen to music today." And at first, you think, "Well, how do you know? Why is that different?" The more times I, I listen to your episodes and you tackle different topics, this is different than when when we were all kids, and maybe when we were all at a certain age. The 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 use of music, the consumption of music. The, the purchase of music, the ownership of music, all these things have suddenly changed. And I, I really sometimes take a good hard look at myself and say, okay, am, am I out of step? Or am I just an outlier? Or am I just a different kind of music fan and music has a different point part in my life? I, I, would, I wouldn't say out of step, but we've lived through the biggest change in music availability. And we've lived through a second biggest change in music availability. We grew up in the LP area, 
uh, in the LP era, and and vinyl or shellac records were what existed since music was being distributed in large numbers. And then we went to the CD, which was a huge change, and then we went to digital. And and all of this in about what 20 years. The CD started in the mid 80s. Um, digital started in, in you know really made it big about 10 years ago. We've just gone through two major changes, and we're able to look at it because we're old. Um, we're able to look at it with a bit of perspective, whereas young people today um, are growing up not necessarily ever having bought a record in their lives. Yeah, that was the thing before. If you wanted to listen to music, you had to buy it. But now you don't really have to do that. You don't really have to own the music to be able to listen to it. You can listen to ad-supported streaming. And that's what they're used to. And it's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. That, you, know, you mentioned the two revolutions. <clears throat> it's really true. And we're so... You know, we were brought up on analog music, and I think even the change from analog to digital is still, for some people of a certain age, is still somewhat of a, a difficult thing. They're running into one of the things I like to talk about is the um, the analog digital paradigm clash, where people try to get their iTunes library to look like a bookshelf of CDs, and so what they do is they make a, a playlist for every album. I think, yeah, a playlist for every album, and then an album. Each album playlist goes into a folder for the artist, and then folder artists go into a genre folder, and they're trying to make it an anal. They're trying to make it analog, because that you, you went to the bookshelf, you grabbed something, you took it out, and you played it. Well, in iTunes, you don't do that. But if I make it look like that, at least it feels like I go and I grab the album and play it. But that's not really how it works at all. It's digital. It's been the the album has been disintegrated, and. That's that's what we can't get over. We can't make that jump. The album is no longer a thing. It's the track and the playlist. If I if I dare make a uh, an, uh, an impolite pun, you can't spell analog without anal. <laughs> that's you can cut that out. Okay, want, never, never never thought of it that way, Doug. Um, uh, yeah, um, Kirk. Um, Sorry, I yeah. hope I didn't shock you there. No, no, um, it's just uh, I just didn't see that coming. Uh, another revolution that I would mention, um, which isn't the way music is distributed, but the way music is listened to, is the portable revolution. Um, we we were at the heart of the Walkman. Um, I was 20 years old when I got my first portable pre-Walkman device. Um, this changed music from something you could only listen to in a fixed position to moving around. And now everyone just takes this for granted. Um, you know, in a way, the music industry has to catch up with all these changes, and it takes a while to catch up for a major change like that. You you may have seen people with Walkman and, and headphones a lot um, back in the day, but that was still only a small percentage in those first years. Uh, it, it took a very long time for the music industry to realize, and the whole home taping thing that they were worried about. You know, these are slow, gradual changes. When When people started buying CDs in large numbers to replace their LPs, which was record companies wet dream you know we've sold these people all these records we're going to sell them again this was something that took a long time this took 10 years for people to rebuild their collections of of you know what they really wanted um and just at the tail end of that is when digital started coming in and pulled the bottom out of the market so the music market has gone through so many changes and, and, and a minor change like amazon giving up on uploads um, is just a mere blip compared to all the rest. Um, I, I think it's really important, though, when we think about streaming, to look at one very key factor. That w arguably the biggest players are in order, Spotify and then Apple. Spotify has, I think, 60 million subscribers. Apple has something like 40. Um, Spotify has ad-supported, Apple doesn't. But the difference is Apple doesn't need to make money on Apple Music. It's not their core business, whereas Spotify does nothing but stream music. So they have to make money. Amazon doesn't need to make music. Amazon doesn't need to make money from their streaming music either. Their core business is getting you to be an Amazon Prime member and buy everything from Amazon. So they probably don't care too much about the few people that they're gonna lose because you can't upload the music because it's just part of this big package. You know. You, you look at Apple Music, it, it's an isolated service among Apple services, but it's kind of standalone. It's separate from the iTunes store, it's separate from the movies and the TV shows. You look at Spotify, there's nothing else there. You look at Amazon, 
it's well you've got your prime music you've got your prime video you got your prime delivery you got prime uh, reading um you've got you know all sorts of things so each of these companies is approaching this from a totally different business plan and that's going to affect the way that they interact with their customers that's such a great point i mean we're, right now for this discussion obviously we're focused on music that I was focused on music in my decision to purchase or not purchase Amazon Prime Music. Um, but overall, that would not have been a deal break, maker or breaker for me purchasing Amazon Prime. You know, it, it, so you, I, your, your point about you know, who is in what business is, is a perfect one. I, I looked at, I, I tried to figure out why they did this. And I guess, you know, they really don't need, I mean, if, if the three of us upload <laughs> A Rolling Stones album. Okay, theoretically, unless they do the matching thing, that's three copies of the Rolling Stones album that they have to store. If it's streamed back down to us, they have to they have to only store one. And so, you know, is that part of the consideration? Well, I, I don't think they do the matching. So, in Amazon's case, each album is unique. Each file is unique. I, I don't think Amazon's worried about the bandwidth or the the the, the storage. You know, they run AW3, which is the biggest storage system on the planet and that and that you know is the motor for most digital businesses so not worried about that my guess would be just a gut feeling is that the customer support for this is onerous that there are so many issues of i upload the file it doesn't upload correctly i can't stream it correctly um that every time that happens they've got to answer a customer support request that wouldn't be surprising actually it really wouldn't i mean think about how many problems you have with iTunes, um, or think about how many problems you hear about people who have iTunes. We have yeah. a pretty good system overall, but you know there are kinks, and you know just imagine the support that you know Apple has to go through. I'm sure Amazon has the same problem. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially for the number, the small number, the minority of people who use. Right. That. Yeah, I think the point is, is probably not a lot of people uploading music, um, because uh, you know some of the music that you buy on Amazon. They do that um, auto rip, so it's automatically added to your library. MP3s are automatically added, so you don't need to upload those. Um, of the stuff I've bought over the years, there's not a lot that's available on auto rip, um, particularly not in classical. But for most people, they're not buying classical, they're buying pop, and that music gets added automatically. So what's left that you have to upload, unless you're a, a, a deadhead or a fan of a specific band, you've, as you said, bootlegs and radio recordings and all that, um, you're not going to be uploading a lot. It, it, I, I, to me, it sounds like something where they just don't want to bother with the hassle, that maybe it never took off enough as it was, and it's not worth promoting a service that isn't really attracting customers. Maybe that's just not Amazon's customer base. Yeah, and, and to your point, it may not, the, the few that they lose or the fa few that they may not gain probably aren't worth the time and the trouble. So. Well, you got to be careful saying not worth the time and the trouble. Um, Amazon is more customer centric than any company I know. I had a problem with an electric tea kettle. Um, I bought it la in January of this year, so it's less than a year old. I contacted the company and they said, no, you have to deal with Amazon. Now, you know Amazon doesn't take returns after 30 days. So an hour ago before the show, um, I sent an email to Amazon saying, well, I don't know what to do. The manufacturer said to contact you. Ten minutes later, here's your return thing. Print out your label. We'll take it back. Um, Amazon, they just don't want to waste time. If you're a good customer, they don't care. They don't want to waste time. They want to get. They want to move on to the next thing um, to sell you more stuff. They they are extremely customer centric in in that way. Good point, D Doug. I wanted to ask you. I want to ask you both, but I'm going to start with you because Kirk sort of um, volunteered that you do this. Do you you have two separate music <laughs> libraries? One for yeah. Apple Music and one for that is not Apple Music. Uh -huh. What software do you use to manage or play the non-Apple Music library? I well, I do what Kirk does. I have Apple Music on one machine, and on another machine I have my file library. So I'm still using iTunes on both machines. Mm -hmm. And if I need to, the two machines are side by side, so they're never apart. Um, but I'll use home sharing or something like that, for instance, on the on the uh, on the uh, Apple Music machine, if I want to access something on the other machine, um, 
I've really gotten into using AirPlay a lot lately um, and sending music around the house. I have some Airport Expresses, and I'm using those with little listening stations around the house. So I get what you're, you're getting at. You're trying to figure out a way, how can I get music all around my house? And now Amazon is not part of the equation. Um, I, you know, I'm wondering about... See, like I said, I'm using, uh, I use these little uh, Class D amplifiers around the house, these little listening stations. Whereas most people would think, oh, I'll just get one of those, one of the voice activated smart speakers that you have. It hasn't entered my brain yet that I should get one of those. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting caught up in the hoopla about it because I can't really see any point in having it. I can do the same thing with my good old analog equipment, my, you know, with, and using and using airplay it may be a bit old-fashioned but i'm getting it done in in a way that seems to make sense to me um right now smart speakers don't make sense to me now maybe maybe i'm getting maybe i'm the old fogey in the equation here smart speakers seem stupid but i know what my smart speaker or my smart home device is going to be when i see it because i've been reading science fiction for years and i know what i'm looking forward to and the things they have out now are not it and so i understand how everybody's really anxious to to jump on the the talk to your home uh bandwagon but it's not where it needs to be yet so i'm just not going to get involved with any of them and i'll use analog solutions if i have to and if that if that means using an old ipod and carrying around music and listening with earphones then sometimes i do that too it, it it's funny i'm just as a quick anecdote, um, I said my partner's brother's here, and so he's really into technology. He used to be a Windows guy, but he just got an iPhone X. Um, and we were talking last night about the Philips Hue lighting system. So I have two lights. There's one that's lighting me from here, and there's one in the corner. And I use them because in my office, they're practical, they're dimmable. I can tap a button and get them both at 50% or turn them both off. And he's like, oh, I don't want that. They're hackable. But I got this Google Home speaker, and it's so great. I can talk to it and tell it to play music. I said, Steve, you have Google with a microphone in your house, and you're worried about a smart light bulb. So I asked him what he does with it. Well, I tell it to play music. And that that seems to me too limited. I can pick up my phone and say, hey, Siri, play music, um, and then put it on AirPlay to something. You know, as Doug said, you use some Airport Express devices. Um, you can have small standalone powered speakers. And you can just use AirPlay, and, and the quality of AirPlay is much better than, than Bluetooth or probably better. You don't have to worry about lag from streaming. Um, I think I, I'm not con this is going to bring us to the home pod that doesn't exist yet. And, and $350 for a speaker to say, hey, Siri, play me the latest, you know, um, whatever popular playlist just seems to not make any sense where the, the whole music consumption thing is not you don't need it for that. Um, so so you were asking about how do we separate the libraries? Same here, my Apple Music libraries on my laptop. Um, but one of the things that pushed me over the limit was when I got um, an iPhone 8 Plus to replace an iPhone SE. And the iPhone SE had 64 gigabytes. And I didn't want to pay for the 128 for the iPhone 8 Plus. And I said, you know what? To heck with it. I'm going to stop syncing my music. I'm just going to use Apple Music on the iPhone. And that way, if I'm outside walking, I don't have all my Grateful Dead music, but I've got enough music to listen to. Um, if I'm sitting in my comfy chair reading over there and I want to listen to some music, I pick up the iPhone, I go into the music app, I stream it by AirPlay over to my amplifier, it comes out of my speakers, and the world is just wonderful. In, the, uh, in, the, in this podcast episode, we were talking about how much music we have. I... Uh, I imagined having an apartment next to a Tower Records and the manager giving me the key and saying, anytime you want to go in and listen to a record, any record you want, you can do it. Just go in. Just go and listen. No problem. And that's what that's what Apple Music is to me. It's like, I can listen to anything I want, anytime I want. I just don't need to possess it. And most of the time, especially at my age, I don't really need to be listening to things 13, 14, 15 times. Once is enough. So if I want to hear the first album from the sensational Alex Harvey band, I can just go to the Apple Music, listen to it, and go, oh yeah, that's what the that's what that album sounds like. And I don't have to listen to it again for another two or three years. So actually possessing it doesn't doesn't make much sense for this casual listening that I do. It's only for the, the critical stuff and the stuff that I'm a fan of. For instance, I need my Clash CDs and 
and all the uh, all the files that I've ripped from all the CDs. I need to have those, but I don't need to have the sensational Alex Harvey band's first album because it's disposable as far as I'm concerned. It's a fun thing to listen to once in a while, but I don't need to have it. So if I can just access it, that's fine. Well, that's always been the, the, the big advantage to streaming for me, is that I get to go and sample a lot of things. I, if I hear you all talk about music, if I have other friends that talk about music, I, I get to go and check it out. And then it, it may or may not be disposable, depending on what I think about it. But in the past, okay, I've got to go and try to either find somebody that will let me listen to it, or if I'm really lucky, have a record store that would let me let me t check it out, because most of the things probably are not on the radio, and you're not going to call in and get a dj to play them so it, or, or it, you get the 30 or 90 second previews on the itunes store well now yeah but before you didn't. well they were originally 30 seconds and then a couple of years ago they moved to 90 seconds but that's not even enough to get to the good part of stairway to heaven you know for 90 yeah. seconds you're not even to the electric guitar part yet right Right, so it it has changed. Things, so many things have changed. Well, one one thing that I find about Apple Music, which is surprising me, is how useful the For You section has become. The more that I'm using it, the more it's recommending records that either, oh, I haven't heard that in a while, or I've never heard of this band. Let me try try them out. Um, a few weeks ago, it popped up a Tuxedo Moon album. I haven't heard Tuxedo Moon in 35 years. And it was great to hear it. And and Mike Doug says, I don't need to hear it again, necessarily. Um, but then it goes into the Apple Music profile that says, hey, he listened to this Tuxedo Moon music, so we're going to remember that and maybe recommend something by Cabaret Voltaire next time, you know, a similar type of band. And and more and more I'm finding for you to, to be, I want to listen to music, I don't know what, rather than go through my iTunes library, I'll go to for you. You got those blocks of four albums for the day or whatever and then you've got the you know new releases your friends are listening and there's always going to be something i want to listen to there and and again i'm an album listener not a song or a playlist listener um and and that's surprising me how good that's gotten over time yeah same i don't know i i it's the, the whole thing is still i mean it still feels like it's a work in progress that we're all trying to figure it out we we've and i this this bothers me about all of us, and, and I'm the poster child for it, that I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it, and I don't mind paying for it. I just I and, and when it's not available to me that way, you know, it, it bugs me. And that is probably part of the problem with all of us today. You know, Doug, to your point, you know, the your home automation system is not there yet. You know, well, it's it's we're in the middle of it. It'll it'll get there sooner or later, but it's it's not there yet. And, and that's where I guess I feel that that way about music and about some of the video streaming services, too. You know, if I'm paying for it, I want to know that I can go back and watch Twilight's Last Gleaming when I want to. And it, and it better be there. And if it's not, OK, now I'm upset because I've been paying for it with that anticipation, with that expectation. And they're not delivering. So we'll see. But this is this is the sort of inherent dissatisfaction with the world that Henry David Thoreau wrote about in 1845 when he was sitting in a cabin next to Walden Pond. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Give it up. Accept what you've got. It was perfect for about three months in, in 2004. <laughs> and everything was just right. I, had, I was buying CDs at a regular clip. And I was able to listen to them. And I carried them around in a little pouch. And uh, there was a certain amount of time. There was a certain period. And it's probably this way for everybody. Where if it could just stay that way um but of course it, you, like kirk says it's always going to be in flux once once they've nailed down how streaming stuff is going to work there'll be the music pills or something where you know you, you there's some other way that you, that's the new rage that people think they're going to make money from or uh, garner more users or more listeners or more customers so you know maybe this is what we're stuck with now and pick an era and and stick with it or you know just be at the mercy of whatever the current current technology is yeah but this is one of the problems of the tech industry that it these tech companies don't make money by staying the same and they have to constantly change they have to constantly reinvent what they're doing and unfortunately they're missing those that 2004 for a lot of people who may be happy the way things are now they may like 40 million tracks for 10 bucks a month that's really a pretty good deal 
but they're going to change something. They're going to pull the rug out from under us again, and we're going to be dissatisfied yet again, and they're going to try to make us pay yet again for records that we've already bought six times. We, we bought the single, we bought the album, we bought the best of, we bought the cassette tape, the CD, the downloads, the box set, the stream, and there's going to be something else down, down the road. So I think we just have to, you know, there's this little bit of stuff that we have that's off to the edge, and we've got to just understand that we have to treat that special, my Grateful Dead stuff, your Albert Spaulding or whoever he was, um, you know, there are these things that are outliers. As for the rest of it, just surf, surf the wave and, you know, pay your 10 bucks a month. Don't worry about talking into some little speaker on your desk to say, ooh, play me, you know, Aretha Franklin right now, because you can, it takes you 15 seconds longer to do it on your iPhone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you think about it, this right here has 40 million tracks in it. This, if if 18 year old me could have had this, my God, the world would have been so amazing <laughs> when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's you're absolutely right about that. You, you lose, we start to lose perspective when we get a little too close to the picture. And when you you look at the music, but, I mean, but, I certainly should be able to find something to listen to on this, you know, through Apple Music, and not be complaining yeah. about what I can't listen to. Yeah, but but as I said earlier, we've been through these changes, um, so it's probably harder for us to adapt than young people who are growing up with all of this who just take it for granted. Well, that's natural. We we took things for granted when we grew up. I mean, you know, our, our parents didn't have so many of the things that we had then. And, you know, they looked at it and said, wow, do you really need that? Is that really important? Well, it was to us, and it's the same way with kids today. Yeah, but if I think back to, you know, how I scoured record stores on Bleecker Street to find this Rare Cure single um, in 1980, whereas now I would just, you know, Google it and it would be there. Um, it's, you know, there's a pros and the cons because it was it was the thrill of the hunt and all that to find this Rare Cure single. Um, but now we're just now all we have is the music. We don't we're not concerned about the rest, about the process, um, about, you know, which B side is there because all the B sides are there now. Uh, so we just need to, you know, get past all this and just accept that, that the, the music spigot is there and we just turn it on. Yeah. Gentlemen, this has been interesting. Um, I've, I've learned a lot of things. You've given me some things to think about. Hopefully you've given the listeners and viewers some things to think about as well. Um, but I want I wanted to go out by letting folks know where they can find you when you're not here, because you both have, obviously, the next track together, but you also do a number of other things. Um, and I'm also I'm going to ask you to take a twist on, on the way you close your show. Don't tell me what your next track is. Tell me what you're listening to right now. Doug, how about you first? Oh, what am I listening to right now? Oh, I'll tell you what I'm listening to right now. Um, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I'm glad I can say it here because I wouldn't dare mention it on our show. I listened to Spyro Gyra this morning, which is a <laughs> jazz fusion band from the 70s. Now, I've yeah. been on this kick recently, and I hope you don't mind if I take a moment to explain this. No. When I was in radio, we were always on the lookout for instrumental music to use as commercial backgrounds when we recorded commercials at the radio station because... I mean, we, the most of the production music I was pretty sappy and old and we were cheap and we didn't buy production music so we were always on the lookout for jazz fusion albums that always had something that sounded contemporary but wasn't you know cheesy something well Spyro Gyro was one of, one of the bands and I'm sorry if you're a Spyro Gyro fan but um, <laughs> they were one of the bands like the Crusaders like um, Pat Metheny like uh, Weather, Weather Report, Report. Yeah, um, uh, any number of bands like that, Wyndham Hill people, um, that we listen to. And I, every so often I get nostalgic and I go, you know, I know that Spyro Gyra album. I'm just, I, I'll just listen to it. And so that's what I've been listening to. Um, it's their first album, I think. I don't remember the name of it. It's actually not bad if you like that sort of thing, if you like jazz fusion. Um, anyway, um, as you know, I uh, am the purveyor of Doug's Apple Scripts for iTunes which is available at DougScripts.com. That's how most people uh, probably know me before we started doing the next track together. Well, what I've been listening to lately is I got an earworm in the past couple of days. I was mentioning it to Doug earlier today. In fact, we're going to do an episode of the next track about earworms and some other things. Um, my earworm is a song from um, Genesis's 1976 album, Wind and Wuthering. It's a song called Blood on the Rooftops. 
and I mentioned it to Doug earlier, it starts with the classical guitar bit. And he says, they all start like that, but they don't. <laughs> because once once Steve Hackett left the band, there's no classical guitarist. Remember, they did that album, and then there were three. So it was basically Phil Collins and his right arm and his left arm. Um, but Blood on the Rooftops is one of these songs that, like, I, I love those the two albums from that year that Genesis released, Trick of, Trick of the Tale and Wind and Wuthering. Um, they've got some really beautiful songs, and they've got some really sort of sappy Phil Collins romantic songs, because this is just after Peter Gabriel left. But this is a great musical song. It's got the sort of Stairway to Heaven intro, and then it gets a little bit heavier. But it's also an example of how bad Phil Collins' lyrics were. They're just like random <laughs> phrases that rhyme. Um, and if you can if if you can forget the lyrics, it's th this is really good music. Um, if they had a good lyricist, like if they had Peter Sinfield, who wrote lyrics for King Crimson and all that, they would have been a much better band. But I've always, these two albums are when I discovered Genesis. Um, I saw them on tour in 1978 when they were playing the music from these two albums. So this is a kind of music that stayed in my core as, you know, it reminds me of a, a long lost period when I had more hair and, and all that. Um, so other than our podcast, The Next Track, which you can find at thenexttrack.com, you can find me at kirkville.com, which is my website where I write about facts and music and photography and books and all sorts of arcane things. Perfect. Perfect. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for both being here. I, a good discussion. Good discussion. Uh, ha happy New Year. Thanks, John. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, and, and Happy Holidays. Yeah, 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 Happy Holidays. That covers everything. That, that way we're safe. Yes. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We'll be back with more. I can't encourage you enough to go and ch check out the next track um, at, uh, it, at nexttrack.com, as, as Kirk said. Um, it really is a fascinating look at music. Um, they don't just, these two gentlemen don't just advocate what they like to listen to. They cover everything. If you hit an episode that might not be for you, fine. Just wait till the next time because they will have a completely different topic. But I promise you, you will find it interesting. If you found this discussion interesting, I promise you, you will find their podcast very, very enjoyable. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Mac Voices Facebook group and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices magazine, free on Flipboard. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash macvoices and join these folks who help keep Mac Voices coming to you. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. 